Hello, friends. Hello, 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 friends. A tradition unlike any other. Oh, 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 my goodness. In your life have you seen anything like that? There it is. Adam Scott, a life changer. Mashed potato. Here it, here it, here it, here it comes. Androids, let's face it. Nobody chooses to play from the rough. And thanks to our great new friends at Manscaped, maybe our listeners might never have to again because the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has arrived and I can tell you with all confidence, it's been a game changer for me these past few weeks. The ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Let's go through the performance package. It includes the weed whacker, up the nose, in the ears, increasingly relevant for people like me as the, uh, the years start to pile on. Never used something like the crop preserver before, but I'll never go back. A ball deodorant straight out of the shower, dry yourself off, whack a little bit of this on the undercarriage, last the full day. Outstanding. The crop reviver, it's more of a, maybe you need a midday refresh. You've gone for a, a run at lunchtime. You've had a gym session. Maybe you've just been hauling boxes in a bloody humid environment. A little bit of a spritz on the undercarriage, fresh as a daisy moving forward. And then finally, but most importantly, Drew's, the best piece of kit in this Performance Pack 4.0, it is the Lawn Mower 4.0 trimmer. Have a listen to this. Music to my ears. This bit of kit, my friend, will transform your situation below the waist from looking like the second cut of rough at a US Open to a neatly trimmed fairway. Now, even better, Manscaped have thrown in two free gifts to the performance package. They are, have a look at these, the Manscaped boxes, outstanding for those of you who never have enough pairs. And of course, the Shed travel bag. You can neatly tuck everything away and take it on the road with you. Now, you can join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer just for our listeners. 20% off free worldwide shipping with the code T. That's T double E. That's 20% off free shipping all over the world at manscaped.com and use the code T, T double E. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for this incredibly important job with Manscaped. Trust me, fellas, your balls will thank you. All right, this is the 19th T podcast. Drew's with you for tonight's episode. Uh, this is, I'm going to say it straight up, this is easily inside uh, the top five to 10 episodes that we've done. Daniel Beckman uh, is my guest tonight. Um, he has a, a phenomenal story. It's hard to describe it any other way. Um, uh, an immensely talented amateur golfer, uh, gave the game away for a number of years um, and then uh, unfortunately got diagnosed with a, a really uh, aggressive form of cancer, was given a 16% chance to live um, and uh, managed to beat the cancer and come back and is now playing back on on the Aussie tour as well so this is um, a phenomenal chat I, I employ you to listen to the whole thing um, of course Marshy's still away but a couple of things that we do have to mention at the very top before we do get to Daniel's episode of course Rory Let's start there. Rory McIlroy wins the RBC Canadian Open. Uh, two shots over Tony Fee now. He was another couple of shots ahead of Justin Thomas, Justin Rose, Sam Burns, Corey Connors. I mean, that's a pretty good top six, if you ask me. Uh, so incredible to see Rory uh, back holding a trophy. We've given the bloke plenty of wax, but um, I'm just so pumped to, to have him back winning. Uh, he, he truly moves the needle of golf. I don't think there was um, a, an unhappy golf fan today. And obviously some, some really poignant comments as well from, uh, from the big fella. But um, it's, it's been a whirlwind week for golf. Of course, the, uh, the new Live uh, Golf uh, tournaments all kicking off over in England. Um, you know, fairly you know, average field kind of put together in terms of uh, quality of, of player um, when you compare it to the, the six names that I just read out at the top there. Charles Schwartz will, uh, walked away with 4.7 million or something crazy like that. Plenty of Aussies in the field. Travis Smythe, uh, you know, faring the best. He, um, I think he walked away with more than a million bucks. Uh, it's been hugely polarizing um, to, to uh, I mean, I've, I've stayed pretty quiet on Twitter. There's been some phenomenal stuff that I've seen this week with guys like Alan Shipnuck getting kicked out of of press conferences and, and asking Greg Norman, you know, why that had happened and he didn't know it. And 
Greg was standing right behind it all the time. Um, Brighton and Patrick Reed and Pat Perez have all gone over to to play the next <clears throat> the next event, which I believe is up in Portland. Um, but it, it's quite it's quite phenomenal. And I mean, look, the, the way that I put it down to, and and probably the most succinct way that I can put it down to. Uh, I mean, in terms of if there's a positive to come out of it, it's that golf has has had a real big shake up, and you know we haven't seen the tour come out at all really, apart from banning the 17 players, including Aussie Matt Jones. Uh, but I don't know if this is the shake up that we really kind of wanted. I, I'm not really sure. I'm, uh, it's hard to put it hard to put it into words. What I what I will say is, you know, I've been a very strong supporter of uh, the PGL from day one because, and the, the simple reason for that is that the money was coming from a far better place. Um, now everyone can sit there and there'll be people listening to this that are say, oh, well, you drive a car, you know, you, you get your petrol from Saudi Arabia. I think there's a, a marked, marked difference between me requiring, you know, an iPhone or, or me requiring petrol to drive my car than being paid an exorbitant amount of money to participate in a sports washing activity. So I think anyone that's sort of in that whataboutism phase can should probably really maybe have a good think about exactly how how well that argument stacks up. Um, I guess that's kind of where I net out on it entirely. Um, for some for some of our younger players, like Jed Morgan was over there, Blake Windred was there. Wade Ormsby, guys who, you know, haven't really broken through on major tours or are just starting their career. I mean, a great opportunity to go and line the pockets. And I think that's kind of, you know, what I mentioned on the show a few weeks back, there's different tiers of, of players. Um, obviously, DJ, I think, is is deplorable in in the sense that, you know, he's a guy who's earned so much money on the PGA Tour and, and literally wouldn't have to work another day in his life. And he's opted to, to be rolled out um, you know, as a as a spokesperson, essentially for the Saudi government, I think is I, I think it's abhorrent in a lot of ways for for DJ and and his reputation has really been tight in a lot of ways. So I, I, it's hard to get into it too much with a one one person conversation here tonight. But I'm sure when Marshy's back, we'll we'll kind of dissect it a little more. It is a major week though. This week we've got the US Open. I am very 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 excited for this uh the country club of brookline brookline rather uh it's i'm yeah i'm pumped i'm really pumped for this um obviously the pga championship is not my favorite of the majors the us open is pretty comfortably third as well i will give you my tips for what they're worth marshy uh obviously uh still on assignment uh in in middle uh in the middle of europe as well so for what it's worth uh here are my tips i'm going with jt to not win uh, I don't think this course is particularly going to stack up well for him. I am going to go with Rory that I want to win. Pretty uh, understandable reason why. I'd love to see him go back to back. Highly unlikely that it will happen, but I'm going with Rory there. Or for the pure shithousery, any of the live guys who have gone over to win. I think that would be quite the laugh if one of if one of them was to be holding the trophy. My roughie is Sung J M. Uh, I did want him to be my roughie for the PGA Championship, but unfortunately he was ruled out with COVID. And my winner is going to be Matt Fitzpatrick. Uh, I'm going back to the well on Matty Fitz. Everyone knows I'm a massive fan of him. Uh, I think this course sets up well. He has won here previously uh, back in 2013 in an amateur tournament. So uh, plenty to love about Matty Fitz this week. For what it's worth, they're my tips. Uh, we're going to have a quick word from our sponsors here. So you'll hear from Marshy's luscious tones and then we'll get straight into Daniel Beckman because, uh, yeah, this is just a, a really cracking episode. Thanks to everyone for listening. Enjoy another major week, the US Open, um, and we'll be back next week. Now, Druids, I've got some great news for those of our listeners out there who, like me, love a matte black finish on your clubs. As our great mates at Cobra have introduced a sleek all-black colorway of its popular LTDX drivers. The LTDX black drivers possess the same performance and design features as the standard LTDX models, but with the addition of a striking matte black finish on the crown and sole, and grey stripe details. And in more good news for those black finish lovers, Cobra has introduced a second colourway with the King Cobra Black Wedge. The wedge features a satin black QPQ finish, 
which is highly durable and helps reduce glare in the sunlight. The LTDX black drivers and wedges are available now. So for more information, visit cobragolf.com. Daniel, thanks so much for joining us on the 19th team, mate. Pleasure to have you on. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Where are you at the moment? Back in uh, back in the hometown of Melbourne, I believe. I am in back in Melbourne. It's uh, very bloody cold here at the moment, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to go and play golf in this weather, I'll tell you that much. I bet. I was watching a bit of the footy today while I was at work and it, yeah, it looked like a very typical Melbourne, uh, Melbourne day of, <laughs> of brisk wind all day. Mate, you look at the forecast every week and it's just rain and it doesn't get above 12. And, oh, it's gross, mate. <laughs> but uh, nice to be home after, you know, a lengthy, lengthy season back on, back on tour, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, no, it actually is nice to have a bit of a break. Um, it's been pretty full on over the last at least eight months. Like it's been kind of in and out, that type of thing. Um, it's nice to have a bit of home time and kind of reset a little bit, you know, spend a bit of time, obviously, the misses and all that type of thing. It's always nice. Um, yeah, no, it's good. It's actually good to be home for a little bit and uh, but cracking back into it soon. Have you, did you put the sticks away for a bit? Like what did you do, you know, post obviously NTPGA was the last event of the, the season. Did you put the sticks away and just relax or keep grinding or what, what's the process post season? Yeah, I, I took a couple of weeks off, um, just completely didn't hit a golf shot for two weeks. Um, as you can believe, uh, coming back out of that was a little rusty, but um, just trying to, because um, I wouldn't call myself older. I don't want to obviously... <laughs> <laughs> to, to say that I'm older, but I'm older compared to a lot of the younger guys. Yeah. So I'm yeah. um, trying to keep in the gym, keep my body fit, you know, trying to keep up with the younger blokes is always a, is always kind of, you got to put a little bit more effort in, I think, in that regard, keep the body in a good state. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it was nice to have the two weeks completely off, kind of reset the mental a little bit, you know, get back to a bit more grounded. Um, but yeah, back, back working now. So. How do you how do you wrap up your your twenty twenty two season? I guess obviously at the back end of twenty one, um, a really good finish at the Gippsland Super Six and a and a T seven was your high finish of of the twenty two season at the Queensland PGA and and how I guess how do you wrap up your your year? Uh, look, it's a hard one because obviously I've done this all before, and coming back this is obviously my first season. It, yeah. Like it feels a little bit of Groundhog Day. I've, um, I've seen this movie back, before. Like, we always say <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, coming back after such a long break, my expectations. I tried to keep as minimal as I could. So just getting through tour school and getting my full card was such a big achievement for me. Um, that whatever kind of happened on top of that was just kind of cherry on top of the cake type thing. So having some good finishes um, was good to see. Um, I wish I finished the season a little stronger. I made lots of cuts, but I didn't really capitalize over the weekend on kind of uh, those cuts made. Um, but all in all, I would call it kind of a, I don't know, six out of 10 type season. Like it wasn't, definitely wasn't my best, definitely wasn't my worst, but it was kind of in the middle somewhere. Well, we'll, I guess that rating will probably make a lot of sense once we unpack your story a little more for people who don't know, don't know your story, but maybe for, for where we always begin is right back at the very start. Where did, where did golf begin for Daniel Beckman? Like what's your, what's your first memories of the game? That's a long time ago now, mate. Um, (laughs) Okay. So I got into the game, my grandmother, um, she played golf avidly for probably the, the, the final 30 years of her life. Right. She played up until she was 87, and she was at a mem- she was a member of a little golf course called Strathallen, little nine hole golf course in Melbourne. It's just uh, sort of tucked away near Bundoora, if you have any idea where that is. And um, uh, I remember one Wednesday, I had a like a day off school. I was probably ten, maybe. And my parents are both at work. My dad's a fireman, and my mum was in the ambulance service at the time. And um, so I got left with Nan, and Nan always plays golf on a Wednesday. So I went out with her. I had no interest in golf whatsoever. I All I wanted to do was go in the bushes and find golf balls. And I used to come out with buckets. Like, and some of them were absolutely torn in half. Some of them were fine, you know, that type of thing. But at the end of the day, I was covered in mud and usually had 50 golf balls to my name. Um, and finally, I, I kind of started watching my nan play and that type of thing. And obviously, I was 10 at the time. So she had some ladies clubs, which were perfect. Um, I finally started having a go. Of course, the first few times, you know, you miss it and you kind of duff it or whatever. Yeah. But I think 
like probably the second day I was out there with Nan, I actually hit one properly. And everyone knows that first feeling of hitting a golf shot correctly. Yeah. Um, and from then it's just been pretty much an obsession ever since. So yeah, right. yeah, it's a, yeah. So that's where it you, all started. You get some clubs or something pretty pretty soon after and, and you're going out playing with Nan like more regularly or you get um, lessons or what's the go? Where does it go to next? So uh, I did a few um, – there were like a week uh, planned sessions that were at Yarrenbach Golf Club for juniors, um, and they're always during the school holidays. So I'll go there for pretty much an entire – which was perfect for my mum and dad. They'll drop me off at 8 in the morning. They'll pick me up at 6 at night. You know, I was there for the whole day pretty much. Um, and I started to sort of find a little bit of form, I guess, so after just getting some general like here's your grip, here's your stance, the see swinger type stuff. Um, and then by the time I turned 12, I was getting pretty decent and I joined up at Heidelberg Golf Club, which is the first golf club I was a member at. Um, by the time I was 13, I think I was down to one and my, <laughs> and my, I made a deal with my dad, right? He goes, as soon as you get to scratch, I'll buy you whatever set of golf clubs you want. Right. right? I didn't think he thought it was going to come this quickly. <laughs> anyway, I got to scratch probably about three months later and I got my first set of Titleist Blades. And it was like they were my, I don't know, I wouldn't let anyone near them. Like I, had, <laughs> I had iron covers on them to protect them. Yeah, I had oh. the whole deal, right? Um, but, yeah, that's pretty much where it all started. Kind of, I started to get kind of decent from there and um, ended up going through, like, the Victorian programs. Yes. Like, yeah. they, they had the, the Victorian junior team and then Colts and then seniors and that kind of um, – Oh, and obviously the, I was in the VIS for yes, yeah. um, a number of years, which was probably the biggest development sort of peak I had during that time, just because you learn so much more about golf and just like, I just played golf. That was literally all I did. I didn't really think about biomechanics or how me working my body, out was going to make my golf swing any better or, yeah. you know, anything like that. You just don't yeah. even think about or even sports like stuff. Like you don't think about the mental because you're so young, you don't really, yeah have that kind of, you know, outward thinking. Um, but, yeah, I just started sort of going through that program. I joined the VIS when I was 16. I was still in school at the time. Um, finishing up high school, obviously, I was never the best student, I would say. I was always uh, <laughs> always one foot out the door ready to go to the golf course at that time. Um, I ended up uh, failing my, my senior year, my year 12 year, uh, at school for attendance because I was at golf all the time. <laughs> um, but they ended up passing me because I went to all my exams. So, uh, But, yeah, that's kind of – and that, that's obviously when I turned 18 and got a car and got a bit more – be able to kind of do my own thing. That is one hell of a, like, improvement from, you know, being a 10-year-old, collecting golf balls in the mud to being <laughs> scratched three years later. That might be the quickest of, <laughs> like, you know, naught to 100 – opportunities that I, that we've had on this show and you know we're up to episode 207 so you might you might have won the race there mate and it's quite that's quite impressive but um you your amateur career I guess was very impressive um you know you, you obviously showcased a lot of talent you said you went through the state team programs you're obviously in this like can you can you sort of wrap up your amateur career and, and maybe pull out a couple of highlights that you know stand out to you anyway sure um uh, I, I won the federal amateur twice. That was probably some of the biggest stuff. Um, I had a few good, uh, some really good finishes when I was overseas, which I was pretty happy about. Um, I think I came second in the Western amateur, which was a really big American tournament at the time. Um, I came third in the Dogwood one year. Um, we did two years of that with the VIS program. And the VIS was set up to a point where we'd kind of travel as a team. So all of us would go together, including coaches, and would all travel together, which I think... Um, in my opinion, was such a good way to do it just because you've kind of got other people to sort of help you through it. Because back then, none of us had traveled overseas. None of us had done that type of travel before. And um, having a coach there by your side kind of leading the way and you also had kind of a manager who would come along with you as well um, sort, of, sort of help you through that, through that process, really kind of got you ready to take that next step into professional career. But as an amateur, I think I had a good amateur career. I wouldn't call it great by any stretch. Um, I think the highest I got to in the world rankings, I think I got to second one year on the Golf Week ranking, which I think I still have a photo. I think my dad still has a photo of that somewhere. He was so proud of me getting to number two in the world. 
Uh, you're being very modest there. Like you're not calling yourself a great amateur, but you got to number two, like in the, yeah. in the golf week rank. Uh, like, it's, it's kind of one of those things that like looking back on it because it was so long ago, I, I had a lot of just good finishes. Like I never really had when I was like, you see these amateurs coming out, right? And they'll go on this spree of wins where they'll yeah. win like half the tournaments they're playing. I never did that. I was just always that consistent guy. I would never finish outside the top 10. I would always sort of have a good week, that type of thing, which that in turn helped me climb those rankings pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, that was always my main thing. I was always just super consistent when it came to, I'd never have like a super bad week. I'd yeah, always yeah. kind of be somewhere around it. Talk to me about this because uh, like the Institute of Sport, obviously uh, in your words there, you, you said you obviously weren't the best student in, in the world. you you're, um, you probably never really took the game in terms of biomechanical or, or the mental side, as you said. When you get to that institute of sport level, there, there is an expectation that you kind of go down that that path and you start to, you know, this is what professional golfers do. You have to, you know, analyse your swing and all that. How big of a change was that for you as a golfer? Because I remember I, I caddied for Dave Michaluzzi here at, at the, the WA Open and we were kind of talking about it and he was telling me that, I think he won some tournament and like they had a meeting with it, with the dietitians the day after. And they're like, so what did you do? And he's like, yeah, I just went out and had a HSP and a Coke. And they were like nearly fell off their fucking chairs that this guy's out having a HSP and a Coke. Like you should have been having, I don't know, salad or whatever you meant to eat. How big yeah, of like yeah. an adjustment is that like for you as, yeah. as a golfer? Look, cause I joined when I was 16, I didn't really know any different at that time. Like I had, I went through some coaching, but it wasn't like uh, the coaching style that you'd see in the VIS. Because when I joined, it was Dennis McDade and Sammy Jameson were the two coaches for the VIS. And basically you got there and you just got kind of given to one of the coaches. Yeah. And I don't really know what the, like the reasoning behind that was or who kind of picked that or what, what, what it was. But, um, and to be honest with you, I never really clicked with that I, I had a coach at the time um this is going back a long way but if you have any idea brendan green is he, he was the, he was the uh pro at harderberg at the time and he was my coach um but he even told me he kind of got me to a point where um i i needed uh something further kind of thing um which was fine he was happy to like hand me on to whatever next was coming and then uh so for that first year it was Sandy james and Dennis McDade. And then uh, the second year I was in there, which I was 17, uh, it turned into Martin Joyce and Darren Cole. Uh, I was under Coley, who still to this day is an absolute legend. Best short game I've ever seen in my life. Still took the money every Wednesday from all us VIS players. <laughs> like, it would bunt it around, hit a 210 off the tee, but just hold chips and get yeah. up and down from set with set <laughs> Um but yeah, so, it, but his coaching style was always very feel based, which is perfect for me. That's exactly yeah. what I need. You give me a feel and I'll try and replicate whatever that feel is. I was never a big, uh, I want to break it down into P1 and P2 and P4 or whatever. I was yeah. always just, okay, how would that feel then? That's how, that's the kind of what I needed to, to, to get my golf swing in a good spot. I don't really care how it looks as long as it yeah. functions correctly. Um, and Coley was perfect for me because exactly how he was. Like he was very, okay, you need to feel it this way and I'll just feel it that way. And he goes, yeah, that's perfect. Don't need to even put it on camera. I don't want to put it on camera because it's looking great. Um, which gave me a lot of confidence, especially through my later amateur stuff to just kind of go out there and just go, I just need to feel that and it's perfect. And that's what Coley said. So that's what I'm going to go with because a coach instills so much confidence in you, in my opinion. Like they can either sort of tear you down and destroy you a little bit if they're not yeah. saying the right thing or they yeah. can build yeah. you up and get you sort of firing on all cylinders. And with the like the dietitian stuff and the sports psych stuff and the gym work. Again, I had no idea. Like I was just kind of going to this so green that um, whatever they told me, I just went, yeah, yeah, no, that sounds good. I'll just do that. Cause I'm usually very easy going anyway. Like yeah. if someone says something and I trust their source is correct, I'll just go, yeah, perfect. Let's go. We're ready to go type thing. Look back then I was <laughs> back through my kind of early teens kind of building up to like 19 i was pretty chubby bloke like i was pretty big yeah. and um i guess the dietitian helped me sort of cut a bit of that off and also actually doing gym work helped a lot um but yeah i kind of uh especially the gym work i think opened up a whole new thing for me like that was something that i never even thought as a golf because you 
back when I was younger, golf, there wasn't looked at as like you have to be this elite athlete to, to be yeah. a golfer. There was John Daly and there was, <laughs> you know, all these guys around that looked nothing like, you know, the guys at the Olympics, for instance. Um, but obviously, as we've seen, especially in the past probably five years, that everybody's in the gym. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're if you're 55 and you're on the um, senior tour or you're, you're 20 or 18 and you're, you're still going through your amateur stuff. Everybody's doing it because they know that if they get their body stronger, it's going to just help their longevity of their career. They're going to get less injuries. You know, all these benefits to it. So, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a very interesting process going to the VIS. I think going at that young of age really helped my career sort of blossom pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, that was great. Was like college ever a thought? It was. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I finished high school, obviously, like I said, I wasn't the most studious person in the world. That's why, that's um, why I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> and and I couldn't think of anything worse than, than going back to school. But it did cross my mind. I got a few offers. Um, one was from UCLA and that was a full scholarship, which was wow. uh, at that time a pretty big like tier one school. Yeah. Um, I decided not to go just because I had such a good thing going with the VIS and also I wouldn't have to do school, which was just perfect. <laughs> um, hey, but works. yeah, I, exactly. I had, look, to be honest with you, I had such a good thing going here that it was hard to kind of give up what I had. Looking on hindsight, going through the college system, um, looking, the, looking at the guys that have come out of that college system, it kind of almost gives you this leg up to go to that US side of golf, which is everyone everyone wants to be. It doesn't matter who you are, that's where you want to be. You're, yeah. If you're any type of professional golfer that wants to do this as a career, PJ Tour is your final destination, you know, and yeah. it's it's one of those things that going to that college system gives you such a big advantage because you're already there. You're like you're already amongst it. And if you have a really good college career, you can already get starts on the PJ Tour now. We've seen that. You know, it gives you a kind of like a leg up into the corn free tour qualifying and all that type of thing. So, um, but yeah, obviously a different time back then. Yeah. So what's the next sort of phase of your career like? Fast forward a couple of years, you obviously make the decision to turn pro. Um, I think yep. I was reading before you had a bit of a tilt uh, on the, the One Asia Tour. Um, maybe okay. take us through that next couple of years as well. Sure. Um, so my first tour school um, was actually at the old Peninsula Golf Course, not Peninsula right. Kingswood that it is known as now. Um, and I played really well. I just had a really good week. Came third in you know, tour school, which gave me um, my full, obviously, Australian tour card. Also gave me uh, my full, at that point in time, one Asia tour card. Yeah. Um, so that tour consisted of, I think it was 15 tournaments at the time, all very well purse, like two million plus purses, that type of thing, which was massive back then. Mm. Um, so basically I did that for uh, three years. I think it was until I until I completely stopped playing. Um, and to be honest with you, I didn't stop playing because I'm sure we're going to get into this because of my yeah. illness. I stopped playing yeah. because I, I I fell I fell out of love with golf. It became because that's all I knew from you know as soon as I started to get good, probably when I was like 14 to that point in time, I, I didn't really know anything else. Like that was my whole identity was golf and. I just wanted to try something new, um, which I'm sure every professional golfer at some point has thought about. You have those down times. You've just made three, you missed three cuts in a row and you're like, oh, what am I doing with my life type thing? <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so after my third season, I decided to step into full-time work and just become a number, which is honestly, I really enjoyed it for the first like just getting a steady paycheck and yeah, yeah. you know all these things that come with full time work. You actually have you can relax when you get home. You know that type of thing. You're not away all the time. Um, and I, I did that for four years. I was at Suncorp uh, Insurance actually, which is very close to actually where I live. Um, and then uh, I got sick, so. Uh, Maybe take, uh, maybe take us through that part if you yeah, uh, tell us yeah, as much as you're comfortable sure. to. And, and, you know, yeah, obviously yeah. I'll probably leave it up to, to you to tell the story, but um, maybe just take us through that sort of next phase of your life. Actually, before I start that next phase, I just want to, mm. I'm going to start this with one thing. Yeah. So I worked at Suncorp, which was um, just on Collins Street. And um, 
I was seeing a skin specialist at the time. Um, and the skin specialist was very cute. Uh, she worked in the same building as me. And funnily enough, uh, on the Wednesday when I went and saw her, she gave me her number, wow. right, on a card with obviously okay. my – and I'm like, okay. And then that Thursday night, I started to feel pretty bad. I, I, that, that afternoon, I was at the gym and I was running on the treadmill and I couldn't really get a good breath in. I'm like, I oh, just put it down to a bad day type thing. Got home that night, didn't sleep at all, was in pretty bad pain. Uh, wake up the next day, just tell work, you know, I'm not coming, I'm really not feeling well. Just went to my local GP thinking I had like a chest infection or something. Um, the GP tells me to go get an x-ray. And I bring the x-ray back to him and he can't see my right lung on the x-ray. Right. And I was, and he's like, I, I don't know how you, you're standing in front of me or breathing. You need to go to the ER. You get someone to come pick you up. So what I do, I got my car and drove myself to the ER and <laughs> the Austin Hospital ER, which is, and I showed them the x ray. They pulled me straight through and um, they looked at the x ray and they said, I've got um, something called a pleural fusion, which is basically building up of a liquid in your lung. Um, so they got this giant metal rod which was, I don't know if I can give you any type of, it was very big and they put it through kind of like your lower back and into the bottom of your lung. And they pulled out a bunch of liquid. It was probably about five liters in the end of liquid out of my right lung. Um, they had no idea what was going on either at the time. So, so, they so, me, so, so what's, yeah. so, sorry, what's going through your head at this point, right? Like you've, you've just gone to the gym, you feel, you're feeling a bit shit, right? And fucking next to that, you've got a rod yeah. in your back. Yeah, I, look, honestly, I was, Oh, at that point in time, I was I was almost in a bit of shock, I think. I was kind of just yeah. like, I don't know what's going on and I hope everything's okay type thing. Yeah. Um, and again, I was not thinking worst case scenario what it ended up turning out being, but I was thinking more like, oh, I must have a bad chest infection sure. or pneumonia or, or something like that, right? Yeah. Anyway, they thought I had pneumonia at the time, so they put me in respiratory ward in the Austin. And the next day, they come get me and they moved me over to the living in Joan ward. And I know exactly right. what that ward is. My mum was in there and so was my nan. Um, so obviously I know exactly then kind of why I'm there. And the doctor comes in and then tells me, um, uh, by the way, I was at work on the Thursday. And this is the, this is the Friday night. Yeah. Right? He tells me, uh, she tells me actually, uh, that I have a rare type of cancer called T-cell lymphoblastic lymphoma. Um, and we're going to start chemo straight away. And at that point in time, I think, again, it was just a lot of shock. Like you, you hear about someone, someone's mate's parrot's dog's got, you know, cancer and, yeah. you know, you don't think it's ever going to happen to you type thing. Um, probably the worst thing out of all of that was calling my dad and my auntie. My auntie's yeah. very... Uh, Let's say dramatic. <laughs> um, but yeah, telling my dad and my family is probably the worst thing. Um, but they've been like, they were there every day, like nothing but supportive. Like I was in the hospital for, so anyway, yeah. So I started chemo that Friday. They basically said, look, with your type of cancer, it's very aggressive. Um, we give patients mostly a 16% chance of living, uh, you're kind of lucky you caught yours very early and you're lucky you're a fit person because usually most bodies who get this can't because the amount of chemo you go through, your body has to somehow deal with that. Yeah. Um, so they started me chemo that night and it was two bags of chemo for the next two and a half years. Every day. I never left the hospital. I was put in an area called the bubble, which is not like a bubble. It's just like mm -hmm. an area which is cleaned, I guess you'd yeah. call it. Um, the food sterilized, the air sterilized, everything's clean three times a day. Certain people aren't allowed in there. If your family comes in, they have to be kind of cleaned down type thing. It was, um, you know, obviously lost all my hair, lost, you know, all that, lost a bunch of weight, got really thin. Um, but, you know, just completely lucky, blessed. I don't know what it is, but... Um, Six months through my chemo, I went to remission. So basically, 
on a CT scan, they couldn't find any of the cancer in my body. Um, and so the cancer itself, by the way, was a, it, it, it comes about as a, as a tumor behind your breastplate, which is like right in your, just, just on your chest. Um, and in the, they said it was there for roughly a week and a half and it was about as big as my fist. Wow. So that was pushing on my right lung and causing it to fill with liquid, which that was so in turn, that was really lucky that that occurred. I probably would never have noticed it. Um, yeah. So six months I went into remission and then, but it's like antibiotics, right? You have to finish your script or whatever. Course, yeah. I had to sort of continue, continue, continue. Um, my dad literally came in hospital every day, like literally every day to see me. Um, my auntie was there every second day, probably my family were there you know, all the time supporting me. And the reason why I premised the story with the fact that this chick, cute girl from Collins Street gave me her number is um, I'm still with her today, actually, her name's yeah. Tara. Uh, our, I we was supposed to go on a date the Friday, the Friday I got pulled in right. the hospital, right? I completely blew her off, didn't call her, didn't, because obviously I had bigger things going on, right? Absolutely. She messaged, she messaged me on a Saturday and goes, like, why weren't, where, where were you? Like, you, you blow me off. And I'm like, look, I've, I've got some pretty good news to tell you. Like, I, I'm in the hospital, I have cancer. And she's like, she didn't believe me, obviously, to start yeah, with. She's yeah. like, yeah, bullshit, bullshit. I'm like, yeah. So I sent her like a picture of me in my like you know, gown thing and a hospital bed. And she's like, oh shit. And that Sunday, she um, brought me in breakfast into the hospital. We had our first date in the hospital. Wow. And Incredible. we've been together ever since. So, yeah. Well, that's that's probably you know the most remarkable five minutes that we've had on this show in <laughs> in three years. And you know, it's not. You know, it's not. Uh, uh, it's a happy story because you've you've clearly come out the other side of it. But it's you know not something that we would obviously love to be talking more about your golf than your your, your health. Yeah, I, I just can't, I can't, I can't believe it is your story. I, I'm I'm lost for words a bit, mate. Like I don't I don't really know what to say. I mean, you know, you know personally, sort of, um, you know, listeners and viewers to this show will know recently that I've had I had a friend diagnosed with cancer, and and a group of our mates shaved our head. Um, I used to have hair down to here before um, and we shaved our head in support of him and and, and you know very similar story um oh, woke up one, sorry, one yeah, morning with, with with uh sore ribs and you know next day had had a diagnosis and and fortunately he's gone down the same path as you and, and in a really really good space but oh, I, good. I just can't even imagine and put myself in in that situation mate like i, I don't you know how do you what are you even thinking during this time like you know you've you've gone from playing on you know, having a wonderful amateur career to you know, playing on the One Asia Tour, you gave it up, you went and worked, and then all of a sudden, like, your life just changes with, with no symptoms apart from, you know, a bit of struggling to breathe before, at, a, at a gym session. Like, can you yeah. can you kind of, like, summarise it, or is it just to... Um, I don't even know. I don't even know what the question kind is of, there, Yeah, no, no, I, I get you. It's, it's kind of, like, you need to get to that point because, obviously, at the start, it's a big shock, and you go through that, like, this yeah. can't happen to me type thing. Like, this, yeah. this is it's wrong and whatever. Um, but then I, I guess going through acceptance and, and just going, okay, let's get on with it. Then like, I'm going to beat this thing type thing. And even then when I was in the hospital, I, I made sure because they, they basically told me the toll that this, uh, was going to take on my body that I know I had to keep myself in good spirits. So I just, you know, cause once you, once you give up mentally, like basically it's almost like your body knows that and just kind of gives yeah. up itself type thing. Yeah. So I guess in, in the end, it, it made me a lot tougher mentally. It made me realize that life is really short and, you know, it could be taken away at any point. And I just got super lucky. And obviously I wouldn't like this wake up call for everyone, but it was one of those, I guess, life changing experiences where you go, well, am I actually enjoying what I'm doing? Cause at that point in time, like, yeah, I was working full time, but I was kind of just going through the, Going through the motions as mm. as a lot of people that um, have a like it was I, I would call my job a very mundane nine to five job. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. basically a, a computer coder, right? It was nothing, nothing special, and uh, it gave me the wake up call to go. Okay, what do you actually want to do with your life? Like, what are what are some goals you have? And and when I was in the hospital, it gave me 
obviously a bunch of time to be able to think about these things. So I basically said to myself at the uh, after I went to admission, okay, well, I'm done with this. Let's finish this off and figure out what we want to do because I, at that point in time, was thinking I'll just go back to work and just sort of keep going, right? Mm. And I kind of got the golf bug again. Like it was just one of those things where I'm like, God, I just thinking back on some memories of when I used to play and, and traveling and seeing the world and all these things. Like back then I looked at it, especially towards the end of my career, I almost looked at it as like a burden. Like it was this thing I had to go do and I was so, yeah. you know, God, I got to get on another airplane. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. But, but it gave me a renewed, um, uh, I don't know, focus or whatever you want to call it into, into let, let's get back out there and give it another go. And I'm not kidding. I, I started, so after I went through all that, I started playing golf again. And this was right when uh, the pandemic hit, yeah. right? Yeah. And I'm like, geez, nice timing. You know, well done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can't, even, can't even go to a golf course. Can't go to a driving range. Can't do anything. So what did I do? I set up a net literally in my apartment. And I'm hitting balls, like not real golf balls, but like yeah, rubber yeah. balls at the net, yeah. just kind of getting a feel back for it and all that type of thing. And finally, you know, kind of all the lockdowns finished and that type of thing. And I got back into playing and le- legitimately my first tournament back was tour school. Yeah. So wow. I'm just, I just kind of went, well, you know, fuck it. Let's just give it a go type yeah. thing. You know, why not? We're here. Like, let's just go. And, uh, okay. So I had to do obviously both, uh, both qualifiers, so there's there's the first qualifier and then there's yeah, the final yeah, yeah. qualifier. First qualifier, I finish on, I think it was four over. This is at Sandhurst. It was pouring a gale all week. It's cold. And I got into a playoff. And it was one spot between five guys. The 10th hole was playing straight into a gale. It's like 420. If it's a good tee show, if it's six iron to like 40 feet and hold it from like across this slope to get this last playoff spot, right? <laughs> Like it was disgusting. It should never have gone in. Went in perfect pace straight in the middle. And these guys, like, who I'm in this playoff with, are like, you've got to be fucking kidding me, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I got through by the skin of my teeth, right? In the first, in the first stage. Second stage, I ended up on plus two, it was down at the middle links again, just blowing a gale like it does in Melbourne. And uh, I get through final spot. Like literally, I got the 30th spot in tour school. And I have my full tour card again. So I don't know what's going on, but I just seem to just kind of keep sneaking through. I don't know if, what it is, but um, it, it feels honestly, I, I don't know. It's it's mind-blowing to see what kind of, especially if you ever saw, like I've got a few pictures, but pictures of me when I was in the hospital and kind of finishing up my treatment compared to kind of me getting back in shape and getting to where I am now. Um, I, it doesn't even look like the same person. Like you look at yourself back, I look at myself back then and, shocking like it's actually mm. shocking like you don't look the same but yeah it's it's honestly amazing to be back playing golf again it's, i don't know what it is what did the what did the doctor say when you went for that scan <clears throat> and it had completely gone because they must have been like they must have been as blown away as you right oh they were, they were shocked they were he said, this is the third patient they've ever had with this disease that have come through and you're the shortest amount of time that's ever gone into remission. He was shocked. His name is John. He's a doctor, the hematology doctor at, at uh, yeah. Austin Hospital. Amazing doctor, by the way. Um, Cara, my partner, was there with me at the time. And honestly, we both broke down in tears. Yeah. I, was, I was probably, I don't want to say happiest moment of my life, but one of them, definitely. Yeah. Like just finding oh, yeah. out that... Um, that I, I might be going back to a normal life at some point would be lovely, you know, that type of thing. Obviously, I said two years ago and I knew that, but it's nice to see that uh, all the, I don't call it suffering, but all the all the crap that I had to put through my body was actually doing something and working. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah. It was kind of that means to an end type thing. And, uh, it was... Yeah, it, it's surreal. I did uh, like I don't know how to explain it. It, it is because you know, as you said before, like sixteen percent chance is like when you hear that figure. Like, I I can't imagine what you're thinking at that point. You're just like, oh, like that. That's probably it, right? Like, I'm sure all this emotion goes through your head, and then you obviously talk about the acceptance and and whatnot. So it's it's yeah. a phenomenal journey 
that yeah. you, you well, at that point, it, when, you, when, they, when they said that to me, I, the first thing you think about is like, oh, God, I'm going to die, which is yeah. something that normal people don't think about during their day-to-day, day, ever. Sure. Like, it, not, not many people contemplate death, which is an no. interesting fact in humans, just because it is, no one wants to think about that. Shit. No, of course it's, not. It's, it's, it's a horrible thing to think about, right? But that's honestly the first thing you probably think, like, what well, the first thing I thought about when I was told that. Yeah, and um, I was obviously very honest with my family and telling them all the facts and that type of thing. And um, my dad said to me, no, nah, mate, you're going to be fine. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I will be. I'll be fine, dad. Don't worry. Yeah. And yeah, just just one of those things like, I don't know. I don't know if it's like the, the support group around me or just the fact that I went in there with like a, you know, let's just, let's fuck this thing up type thing, you know, type yeah, attitude. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. It's just one of those things that you look back on and it's just, it's, it's a memory that I look back on almost fondly, almost, even though it was a horrible experience. Yeah. Right? I was, I was going to say like, it, the way that you talk about it is like with a real sense of pride. I don't know if that's, if that's accurate. Absolutely. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Go yeah. through that. Go, go through chemo. I would not worse. I would not wish on my worst enemy. It's horrible. Yeah. yeah. Like think about, think about this. Think about the worst hangover you've ever had. Right. Mm. Imagine that mm. every day. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's literally what it feels like. It just feels like you're, you're hungover. You can't eat. You feel like you're going to throw up all the time. Your skin's crawling. It's horrible, yeah. horrible stuff. But so, it, yeah, like, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, so when you can then come back to golf, mm-hmm. what's that first swing like? Oh. You got the net out the back. You got the rubber it was, balls. Out. Oh, it was. I were don't you, know. Were you don't, like weirdly just like pumped about it? Like, you know. Uh, yes. You, you got well, this, honestly, like I was like, like, it's like I was 12 again. It, yeah. It, the driving range at Heidelberg hitting balls with my dad. Like, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's one of those things that was like that. Everything was fresh again. Everything like you know, you forget about all the demons you had. Yeah. Because if anybody, if any golfer plays for an extended period of time, everybody's got demons. I don't care who you are, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of just like you forget about all that stuff, and you just kind of go and play. Like it's just, it's it's a game. It's supposed to be just played, right? And it was honestly those first few months were kind of just finding it again, like finding the little club face, finding my golf swing again finding that touch again, you know, all that type of thing. And it is like riding a bike almost, like you kind of come back to it and you kind of remember a lot of stuff that you used to do and, you know, drills that you used to do and all that type of thing. And when I came back, um, I joined at uh, Spring Valley Golf Club. Amazing golf course, by the way, if you've never come down and play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next time you're here, I'll, I'll take you down there, right? It's done. Like a hidden gem on the sand belt, in my opinion. Yeah, right. Um, and Marty Joyce is the pro there. Right. He's at the, <laughs> the, the, we've got two ranges there. There's the North Range and the South Range. South Range is the long range. That's where Marty teaches out of. And I just rock up one day. Didn't tell him I was coming. I hadn't seen Marty in 10 years. Probably, yeah. Right? Yeah. And he goes, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> I said, mate, I just, I just joined the Spring Valley now. I'm back playing golf. And he's like, oh, well, mate, you know, if you ever need me to have a look, you know, I'm happy to. And honestly, we've just been... That's why I practice every day. That's you know, Marty is down there every day. You know, if you ever need him to have a look, he's an amazing golf coach, amazing mind. I call him Golf Yoda. He's just knows everything about everything when it comes to golf. It's it's insane. But yeah. So, like, I, I guess golf. Um, golf for me is like it's the stupidest but most fun game in the world, right? Like, you think about what you're actually trying to do. Like you're trying to hit a ball that's like, I haven't got one near you, but you're trying to hit a ball that's that big out of a club that's that big and only that much of the club face makes the ball go in the right direction that you want it to and the hole's fucking miles away. Like it's the stupidest game in the world when you spell it out. Like but it, it can be so much fun, and but it can be as equally frustrating on, on the course. I'm wondering how now you obviously having been through everything that you've been through in your life and the frustrations that we all feel on the golf course. And they're really exacerbated for yourself because that's what you do for a career, right? So you're playing for money. How does your life and everything that you've been through relay now to the golf course? Are you just 
agree? Like, how, how do you sort of, how does that all just fit with you? Look, I, I'm personally, I'm, I'm a very competitive person. Like, yeah. I get white line fever. I used to play basketball <laughs> as well, like a lot of years. And yeah. I'm still that way. Like, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're my best mate or, or you're a bloke I don't like. I want to beat your brains in, not, not <laughs> physically, but on the golf yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I look, to be honest with you, I still get frustrated on the golf course, but it's yeah. more the fact that I, I'm, I'm an old, I'm, I'm a bit more mature now than obviously what I was. I'm much better at just kind of letting things go. Like you, you got to kind of go into, especially playing tournament golf as a professional that everybody hits bad shots. I don't care if you're Tiger Woods, I don't care if you Joe Blow plays off 45. Every, every single player hits bad shots and you're going to hit a bad shot during this round at some point. But it, you have to, at that point, go, okay, that's fine. They have, like, imagine, the, the best thing I've heard was when you hit a bad shot and you say you hit it in the trees, you got to kind of almost tell yourself, how good is this save going to be that I'm going to make from over here type thing, rather than looking at it going, God, you're a fuck with hitting in the trees type thing. And... <sighs> I've been, I, I read a lot more than I used to now as well. So I've been, been reading a lot of the Bob Rotella books, which I would honestly say to any golf I have a read, I don't care what handicap you're on. Um, and, and going through the experiences that I've been through that I don't sweat the small stuff anymore. I'm just kind of very cruisy with it all. Like even, like I used to almost get super nervous and over stimulated before I'd go out and play because I wanted it so bad. And that was my like white line fever thing kicking in. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've learned to kind of control that. I keep that kind of a bit lower than what it used to be. A bit more kind of, you know, even yeah. keel yeah. rather than try and hit a 400 off the first tee. <laughs> um, uh, and I think especially with the extra years that I've, I've kind of had to mature and, and the experiences that I've been through, it's just gave, given me a lot easier outlook. Like if I play bad today, it's not the end of the world. It's not this isn't life or death. Like it doesn't, if I play poorly today, my girlfriend's still going to love me. My dad's still going to love me. Like it's not the end of the world. Who cares? Right. Yeah. Obviously everyone wants to play well every day, but unfortunately that's never the case. <laughs> that's very true. I mean, like how, where do you, where do you kind of, how do you describe where your career is at now? Cause obviously, you know, you lost so many years out with your own health battles. You took the, the time off. Um, to go, yeah. you know, be a number like the rest of us, and uh, and of course, COVID was like a white elephant that we haven't really spoken about at all. But yeah, how, like, you've you've lost a bloody good chunk of time in there, like you know, really yeah. out of the you know sort of very formative professional years, anyway. Yeah. Um, look, it, it doesn't bother me. I, I'm I'm out here doing the best I can with what I've got, type thing, right? Yeah. And. I don't care. I'll still play in golf when I'm 80, if I live that long. Yeah. Like it's just one of those things that I'll always continue doing. I love it. It's my passion. Like I will, if there's anywhere that I can go to kind of switch off my brain and, and sort of get out of my own head, I'll just throw on my headphones, throw on some music and, and hit a bucket of balls. That's like my way to sort of de-stress almost. Yeah. Um, and where my game is at the moment, I, I definitely think it's not, back to where it was, that's for sure. Um, but it's getting there. Like, it's going, I'm not expecting to be my best again, like right now, because, you know, I've had such a long time off and been back playing now for like two years. And I'm not expecting miracles, but um, I always think it's always the 1%. It's, it's just that doing it constantly every day, you're going to, over a long period of time, you're going to get better and better. And if I take that approach, like I don't like if anybody takes that approach, I, I just can't see how you can go wrong. As long as you're working on the right things, you're doing the right stuff in the gym, you know, you're, you're keeping yourself healthy enough, all that type of thing. That if you just work out, like you don't have to. Everyone thinks they're going to go out and put in eight hour, ten hour days at the golf course. You don't. It's it's you just completely destroy yourself doing that stuff. You know, Tiger Woods yeah, used yeah. to do that when he was you know twenty one. And everyone's seen that famous Tiger Woods workout schedule, which he gets up at six and goes to bed at eight. No one can do that. No, no. one can concentrate for that period of time. So, um, And the funny thing is, is when I came back, I thought I needed to do that, right? So yeah. I would go to the golf course and I'll get there at six and I'll leave at six. Like that was just my day every day. And Marty was actually the one that told me, mate, you got to stop this. You're going to like, you got to, you burn the candle both ends. You got to run yourself thin. And he's put now a five hour limit on, 
how long I'm allowed to be at the golf course. So <laughs> whenever I go to Spring Valley, he goes, how long has it been, Daniel? I'm like, oh, it's nearly five hours, mate. Don't worry, I'll be gone soon. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's more like figuring out what you can do for a long period of time. Like how, how long can you actually go and practice for functionally um, and get up and do the exact same thing the next day? And I, I think if I continue doing that, I'll, I'll just get better and better. So looking forward to this season. A uh, couple of quick ones before we let you get out of here. Um, sure. uh, a, a funny one that I read, uh, but also I don't know how, I don't think this one's funny to start with, but uh, the Port Hedland Pro-Am in WA. Mm-hmm. DQ'd for a wrong scorecard. That's not funny. Oh. The next one's funny. Like, what happened up in Port Hedland? No, it wasn't Port Hedland. It was um, Quinana. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. I'm getting Pretty sure the information it was Quinana. wrong here anyway. No, that's okay. So that was my first ever pro-am back, right? Yes. I'm playing with another professional and we get in and um, we're doing the scorecard thing as you do, signing the scorecard. We're at 67, yet perfect, just handed it in, right? Didn't even look at it. Just because I uh, I expected I was playing with another professional, I didn't even look at it. Um, I walk upstairs and we're eating dinner and I'm looking because we've got an app on our phone that we use for the yeah. um, to check the scores and stuff. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm leading. Like, what's going on here? Yeah. Anyway, I look at it and go on. I'm looking at my score. Like, you can press on, you can see your scorecard. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's not correct. Those two numbers are incorrect. So I had to go back downstairs. I'm like, ah, who was who was down at the time? Anyway, one of the PGA guys is down there. And I go, mate, my scorecard's correct, but those two numbers are wrong. Like, they're around the wrong way. And he goes, ah, oh, bad luck, mate, thank you. I'm like, oh. Oh, <laughs> really? first, order, first order we're back. I'm like, oh, God. Anyway, and you're leading the you live and you learn. You and you're leading the thing to make it even worse. Yeah. Um, the next one I think is a bit funnier, but the Vic PGA. Uh, so you, you come very close to missing your tea time. Oh, and by getting stuck. Oh, in, God, in the is... car. I don't. I don't know if it's the car that you bought when you were 18 years old, but you you got stuck <laughs> in the car. <laughs> No, this is honestly one of the worst days I've ever had, right? I get up in the morning. <laughs> I don't tee off until quarter past one, right? Which I'm yeah. like, I have so much time. I'm up at 6 a.m., right? <laughs> Having my breakfast, you know, just kind of relaxing, moseying around the apartment. And I'm like, I'm going to get down there a little early and I'm going to do some putting. I'm like, yeah, yeah. So I jump in the car at like 9 o'clock. By the way, I'm, I'm in uh, West Melbourne and I had to get down to Moon Links, which is like an hour and 20 minutes away. Like, yep, that's fine. Jump in the car. Uh, this is nine o'clock, by the way. Jump in the car, and I get out to the um, the Monash, which takes you down kind of that direction. And I get to there's a tunnel, the, the Burnley Tunnel, and it is banked. Like, I mean, not moving. Anyway, I'm sitting there going, oh, don't worry, I've got you know heaps of time. I'm just you know whatever. This will clear soon, whatever. Three hours later, I'm still in the tunnel. <laughs> Literally still in the tunnel, right? Anyway, I'm freaking out. I'm calling the PGA going, mate, I'm not going to make my tea time. I'm stuck in the Burnley Tunnel. So there was two accidents in the Burnley, Burnley, the Burnley Freeway, that, uh, the Monash Freeway that day. Motorcycler came off his bike and I think someone got hit fixing a tire or something in the emergency lane, which is horrible. Like, think about my issues. Like, I was just trying yeah. to make a tea time. These guys yeah, had much yeah, more yeah. stay than I had. Anyway, I I am doing – so, finally, it frees up, right? And this is probably 12.30. So, I've got 40 minutes to get down to Moodle Links, and I'm not even at the end of the Monash yet. And, by the way, this is an easy hour trip. I am breaking – like, I am breaking land speed. I'm an I-30, by the way, which doesn't <laughs> go that quick. I'm breaking land speed records to get down there. I don't know how many red light, ca- how many cameras I went through because I know there's lots on the way down there. I didn't get a ticket though. Till this really? day, did not get a ticket. I w- I'm not kidding. I was going the fastest that car's probably ever gone. Right. <laughs> anyway, I, I I call Heath. Heath at the PJ. Rip a bloke, by the way. Call Heath and I go, mate. I'm coming in the front gate. He's like, how the fuck did you get here? This guy, I don't want to talk about it. I'm coming to the front gate. I know I'm off. And by the way, there's the, so if you ever played Moodle Links, the, on the Legends course, it doesn't actually come back to the clubhouse. So there's the first tee and they had another group going up the 11th. Lucky enough, I was off the 11th. So I had to like get out there as well. So 
if you've been to Moodle Links, you go down this giant sort of driveway bit and then it takes you through kind of like some housing development. They opened up a gate for me to drive through the housing development out to the, <laughs> out to the 11th tee. I pull up to the 11th tee. Heath's already got the boot open, getting my club out, clubs out of the car. He's put them on the back of the car. He's driven me to the 10th tee. The guys in the group in front was literally walking from hitting their, their second shots into the par five. And I walked on the tee and hit my shot. I'm not kidding. I made it by 10 seconds, <laughs> like literally 10 seconds. And by the way, I played like an absolute prick that day. So it's just, I, I, I wish there was a better. I wish there was a better first drive story. go. Uh, uh, way left, like 50 <laughs> left. <laughs> hey, you made it. That's a hell of a story. Uh, I did. I, look, it's better than getting like a, because if you miss a tea time or in your, your, um, you're playing professional event, they like give you a bit of a market, you know, so I'm happy I didn't miss it. Absolutely. Uh, we'll let you get out of here because that's, um, that's I think that's a good one to, to end on. This has been uh, easily one of the best chats that we've had and, and a phenomenal story that we've had on, uh, on this show, mate. And, you know, you've got a wonderful story. Great to see you playing golf. Great to see you healthy, mate. And um, we wish you the very, very best for the upcoming season and, and hopefully we see you holding the trophy pretty soon. So thanks for jumping on and having a chat to us. Perfect, mate. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.